Today I have with me uh, former CIA uh, Ray McGovern, where you're going to be talking about Ukraine, uh, Russia, Vladimir Putin. Uh, is the world being dragged into World War III? Uh, who's really behind the Nord Stream uh, pipeline explosion? Ray, thank you so much for coming on and, and helping us better understand what's really going on in the world right now. You're most welcome, Stephen. I, I just hope I can help. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as you know, we're, we're not, not only are we dealing with a Russia-Ukraine war, but uh, many people are now saying, this is a humanitarian crisis. NATO needs to intervene and stop this fighting. Now, on top of that, in the last few days, we have this massive explosion uh, of the dam in southern Ukraine in a Russian-occupied territory. Who do you think is behind this? Was this an explosion that just happened, as some people are saying? Um, and are the people downstream from this carnage, are they just out of luck for the next couple of years, or is there anything that can be done? What 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 are your thoughts on the explosion of of this uh, of this dam? Well, there are uh, three basic alternatives. One is structural damage and pressure from the ever rising uh, pool on top of the dam. It had been artificially raised for a couple of weeks, and the, the dam had already had structural damage, so we can't rule that out. And these are acts of God. Uh, State Farm will not insure such things. <laughs> nobody, will, nobody will, okay? So that's possible. I think it's more probable that the Ukrainians did it, uh, only because it doesn't make any sense for the Russians to do it. I mean, Look at it. If this is a, an incredible lever that the Russians had control of, now, if they wanted to flood that part of Ukraine, uh, open the floodgates for God's sake! <laughs> you know, do it gradually. Or do it a big, but but don't don't blow the thing up. I mean, if you're going to blame the Russians for it, then you have to be able to blame them for blowing up Nord Stream too even though that didn't make any sense, you know? I mean, they, they could have just cut off the gas supply, for God's sake. So, so that's the basic thing about blaming the Russians. And what's most interesting here is that so far as I know, and I haven't checked thoroughly this morning, but the U.S., U.K., most of the, of the NATO nations, not the clown who's the head of NATO or the clown that's head of the EU foreign policy, most of them have, have been much more discreet than usual. They have not knee-jerkedly <laughs> blamed the Russians. Uh, John Brennan hasn't been allowed on MSNBC to say, oh, I was a Russian. It was the Russians, just like he did about the Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, and there's something really going on here because Zelensky, of course, has blamed the Russians. Uh, are we not supporting Zelensky on this? Oh. It, it's one sign of, well, two, two good signs that I have in mind that uh, suggest, strongly suggest, that uh, one element of our government is prepared to throw Zelensky under the bus, as we say in Washington, okay, when I was there. What do I mean by that? Well, we talked a little about Nord Stream, and Nord Stream we're talking about separately from the damn dam, right? <laughs> okay. But the Washington Post, which pretty much is inspired and fed by the CIA, my former, uh, former place of employment, I uh, said uh, three days ago that uh, the Ukrainian government blew up Nord Stream now. Nord Stream, okay? Not the, the damn dam, okay? My God! <laughs> this calamitous event, which most of us know the U.S. blew up, they're blaming it on the Ukrainians. They're blaming it on a general, the commander-in-chief of Ukrainian forces, who hadn't been seen for, well, I think about a month now, okay, 
Zaluzhny. I say Delusiony, Zaluzhny, okay? Now, what's that all about? Blaming Kiev for the blowing up Nord Stream? Wow, that's new. So what I'm saying here is that these people in the Washington Post, fed by the uh, CIA and other intelligence services, you know, they take advantage of this celebrated leak on Cape Cod to say, oh, we, we have 20 more documents and we give them to the Washington Post and they're distributing them gradually. And this, here's a bonkers one. Whoa, look at that. Ukraine blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. So what I'm saying here is that new, before they were saying maybe informal, six Ukrainians and one doctor walked into a bar. I'm not into a bar, walked onto a yacht. <laughs> before they were saying that, now they're saying the Ukrainian government. So that's one. Number two is the reluctance to blame the Russians for this horrible, horrible episode. Uh, which Zelensky has blamed them for. Uh, did Zelensky tell the U.S. that he was going to do this? Did the U.S. tell Zelensky to do this? Well, my my reading of this is, yes, part of the U.S. government, namely the State Department, Victoria Nuland, who is running this, this area, she may have told Zelensky, yeah, go ahead and blow up uh, blow up that dam so that we don't have to have a lot of publicity about this feckless offensive that, that we require, that you would say, okay? So that's quite possible, okay? But there are other strains in our government, like Blinken. Now, Blinken made a speech in Helsinki, I think it was Friday. My God, he's unhinged. Uh, he talks about a strategic defeat that the Russians have suffered and all this kind of stuff. You know, I was so moved <laughs> by it that I, I, yeah, this guy's from Yonkers. I said, well, this guy from Yonkers has gone by bunkers. I mean, it's really, really completely bunkers. So you have you have Newland and, and Blinken, these guys who are running the foreign policy for Biden. Biden's not really with it. Let's face it. Sullivan, I don't know. Sullivan hasn't said much yet. But then you have the military. Uh, Chief, uh, the um, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, what did he say recently? Well, when Biden spontaneously said, uh, when Zelensky showed up at that big multilateral meeting and said, I hate to tell you this joke, but we're kind of, we lost Bakhmut. I made a big deal out of that. I'm sorry about that. Well, what does Biden do? He says, no problem. We're going to send, we're going to let F-16 come, okay? F-16. So next day, Millie is asked about F-16s. He's, oh, yeah, well, yeah, great, great. We could send, oh, we could send 16 or we could send 36. But, uh, you know, the Russians have a thousand of these. That they're, they're much closer and they're really superlative. So, uh, yeah, we, we could do that. Uh, hello? You know, so... Milley and the military don't want to get involved in a nuclear exchange with Russia, for God's sake. That's what it's all about here in Ukraine. They realize they're outmatched in a conventional and perhaps even a strategic relationship. So, so there's this battle royale, as I see it, going on within the administration. What's new is the reluctance of MSNBC and the rest of them to blame Russia. There was a little vignette. I was on an interview yesterday. The interviewer said, you know, I w woke up about six o'clock and I got this news that, that that Russia had blown up this dam. I think it was MSNBC, he said. And then an hour later, no, the, the headline was the dam was blown, but we don't know who did it. Wow. How do you how do you account for that, Ray? <laughs> so, well, that's very easy. We always talk about, you know, when you get the memo, you know what to say. Uh, within an hour, it took an hour to do the memo, right? <laughs> get the memo spread around. And then, of course, they're all saying, well, you we know how, how this happened. And as I say, there are three, three possibilities, a structural thing, Ukraine for its own reasons, and the Russian thing. Uh, last thing I'll say before I forget, very significant, uh, the... Chief, well, the defense minister of Russia, uh, Shoigu, he briefed two days ago what happened during the first two days 
of the counteroffensive. Okay, and the loss is horrific: thirty-seven hundred Ukrainians dead, uh, fifty tanks completely destroyed, fifty. What else? So uh, fifty other things. That, you know, the now, if he's anywhere near the truth. That's a very horrendous loss. So there's one theory that all this business about the dam uh, helped to obfuscate the fact that the so-called counteroffensive is launched and it's a bloody disaster for the Ukrainians and so forth. So I just want to say that Shoigu explained this by saying, well, we think that they wanted to flood that area so that they, so the Ukrainians could deploy more troops up uh, up where they're needed near the nearer the Donetsk, okay, but that doesn't hold water either, because once that stuff dries, okay, and if Ukrainian troops are in another area, the Russians have a have an easy way all the way to the west bank of the Dnieper, and of course there sits Odessa, uh, the pearl here, and Odessa really is the pearl. The question is whether Putin will seize Odessa or use it as a bargaining tool. And as I've said before, I think on your show, he's indicated that Odessa is up for grabs. They can they can use Odessa as a, what do they call it? Yabloka, Razdora, an apple of discord. Think about your mythology. Or a way to, to address mutual interests and have a peaceful solution. So sorry to take on that, take, this long, but I'm thinking this thing through, and yeah. and those are all my thoughts, and I don't have any others, Stephen. Yeah. No, I. This is why I like having you on because uh, you bring such a unique perspective. Okay, you you had touched on the explosion of Nord Stream, so let let's go down that rabbit hole. So um, the the post, um, you know, New York Times, they're now positing that this was done by Ukraine, by basically uh, a, a SEAL team, Ukrainian special SEAL team, uh, six people on a yacht. Uh, you know, two months ago, the New York Times was telling us it was people on a yacht uh, as the German chancellor was here visiting. Um, so we have two competing narratives. It was either the United States, the CIA and the Navy out of Florida, uh, or now it was this Ukrainian army, or, or excuse me, UK, Ukrainian SEAL team. Um, are we being fed new information through the 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 post, through the CIA, yeah. or are we being yeah. fed the narrative that they want? Well, it's stage three now, okay? The newest one is the Ukrainian government is responsible for, for blowing up Nord Stream. That's completely new. This earlier thing about uh, six men and a medical doctor walk into a not a bar but a, a, a yacht and go. You you could see pictures of the yacht. <laughs> There's no way that could have done it. Okay, that was simply a counter narrative to what Cy Hirsch put out there. He doesn't fool around. He has, in my view, the correct story. They just needed something else. It didn't have to be provable. It didn't, it didn't have to hold water. Just something else that the media could point to. And they said, well, these unofficial Ukrainian. Now, the third stage of this disinformation thing is, whoa, this was the Ukrainian government. This is the Ukrainian military under the direct control of Zaluzhny, the guy who heads up the military, and it was done by, uh, by, as you say, Ukrainian divers and so forth. So that raises the whole thing. Now, is this all in good information? No, no, it's processed from the CIA through the Washington Post and now the New York Times. And they're repeating this thing. The Times picked it up saying, well, my God, Ukrainians blew up Nord Stream. Now, if that isn't a hint that they're prepared to throw that some elements of our government uh, preparing to throw, uh, not Zaluzhny, Zaluzhny too, if they can find him, but Zelensky himself under the bus, particularly if the only person that told him to blow that, that dam was Nuland and Blinken, uh, there's got to be some, some sort of uh, 
confrontation between the military who know how feckless this all is. And, you know, Millie's only got another month or two in place. He's done some strange things before. Uh, I, I would not put it behind beyond him uh, to be instrumental in these, uh, these curated leaks that show what Millie wants to show and what those with an ounce of sense within our government, if there are others, want to show. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this could be, it, it is, uh, the timing is very strange that number one, uh, it makes Ukraine, you know, look bad, not good. And number two, regardless of what the truth is, my mind sees that the pre the sitting president of the United States in either scenario uh, approved an attack on Germany, which which is one of the G7, which is a NATO partner. You know, they're they're sending us baby food because our government can't even make sure babies have formula. Germany's donating all of this baby food and we're allowing their entire economy to be blown up, their affordable gas and oil to be blown up. It, it just seems very odd. But it, it, Biden is at the center of both of those narratives. Uh, Stephen, um, theoretically, you're quite right. I don't think Biden is completely with it. I asked a, a very good psychiatrist who I know quite well, terrific reputation. I said, do you think that he's calling the shots here? Or He said, Ray, it doesn't matter. I said, what do you mean it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter. He was doing the same things what Blinken and Sullivan were telling him before, <laughs> before he degenerated, okay? Now, there's the key. I uncovered something yesterday that I think is worth repeating. On the 5th of October, apropos of not much else, uh, Biden was down in Fort Myers, Florida, and he was inspecting some hurricane damage, I think. Okay. So the mayor of Fort Myers, Florida comes up, hi, Joe. Uh, and, and Joe is overheard on the mic saying, nobody F. Um, you know the rest of the word. Nobody Fs with a Biden. Okay. Now, I went back to my psychiatrist friend. I said, how do you, how do you read that? And, and how, how do you think Putin reads that? And he gave me some psychological gibberish, really. But my view is that, you know, this is sort of puerile, uh, adolescent at best. Nobody, you know, with me, I come from the Bronx. I know what that means. That means that you're willing to hit out at anybody. And so what I'm saying here is that Putin and his generals have to recognize that this guy not only may not be fully compass mentis, uh, but that he's set a puerile and saying, well, this is an ego thing and nobody's going to nobody's going to F with me. And and second thing he says always is, you know, China aspires to be the major economy, major military people in the world. That's not going to happen on my watch. But what does that indicate about the guy? Uh, whatever it indicates, what it indicates to Putin and to Xi Jinping, that's what's important. Not what it indicates to me, but I think I, I can read them appropriately and say, well, this guy, you know, we have to be... We have to be at full alert because there's no telling what these guys will tell the president to do. And it's, oh, yeah, nobody. remember, Mr. President, you said nobody's going to F with you. <laughs> All right. Well, we. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, it almost came across as an invitation. And, and they they certainly have. Um, you, you brought up Putin. Um, do you I'm reading in the news again. I, I it, it's so hard to decipher what's truth and what's narrative. Um, the, the media is saying that the Russian people, especially the elites or the wealthy, they're now souring on Putin. And uh, there could be a revolution to overthrow him uh, and, and end this war. Is, that, uh, is there any truth to that? Or is that, again, a narrative, an anti-Russian narrative that's being pushed on the American people. 
I think it's 95% the latter, you know, a narrative. Uh, the 5% has to do with something I can't quite explain, and that's this fellow Trigosian, <laughs> the head of those uh, GRU-sponsored folks there that pretty much did did the deed in uh, Bakhmut. You know, why does he get away with criticizing the defense minister? Why does he get away with lots of things that he's saying? I think he has political ambitions. So one would think that Putin would just squelch him, put him somewhere, assign him to Africa, where they also have that kind of military. So that's the discordant note. Uh, I think Putin should be able to squelch him unless he sees some merit in, uh, in having this, this indication that, uh, you know, it's possible uh, to dispute the real commander in chief in Russia, uh, try that in the United States. Yeah. Well, and Colonel McGregor has hinted at the fact that, uh, you know, anything Prigozhin says has probably been approved, even if it is negative or critical of Putin. Um, but I, I didn't consider the the political uh, ambitions of Prigozhin, but perhaps Putin sees him as uh, you know, a, a general Julius Caesar who can complain all he wants, but won't cross the Rubicon in order to <laughs> actually attack Putin. And so Putin's like, OK, I, you, you can say what you want until you cross the Rubicon and you come for me. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll just let you continue to be an effective force, um, you know, in this in this battle. Um it's been very I interesting. Like, yeah, I like that interpretation. I think you're right, Stephen. I think that's pretty much what's afoot here. Were he to go on that other side of the Rubicon, well, you know what happened to Caesar and to his armies. So, uh, you know, uh, I think once that happens, I think we can expect Putin uh, to put his foot down. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Until he makes an actual move, it's just internet rant. Um, and you know, maybe some of it is a, a little bit approved, um, but it's hard to know. Okay. Last, last question. Um, Putin is spreading his nuclear capabilities to Belarus, uh, inviting others to take on Russian nuclear weapons. Um, do you see the, uh, admittance of the F-16 jets, uh, as, provoking World War III, as Biden told us a year, a year ago? Um, do you see Putin spreading the nuclear love uh, to other countries as problematic? Or is this just all part of flexing muscles and, and uh, posturing? I see this, uh, Stephen, as reactive. The first time Putin raised the nuclear issue was after that yeah, her name was Liz Truss. She was prime minister of Britain for a month or so. <laughs> and she said, uh, yes, I welcome uh, being able to put my, my finger on the trigger. I have no hesitation uh, of the nuclear trigger. I am up to it. And then I was certainly, the, 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 the results would be horrific, but I, I could do that. It was only three or four days after that that Putin said, and in a matter of fact, aside, you know, don't forget, we have nuclear weapons too. Now, with respect to Putin encouraging other countries to accept nuclear warheads, I know of no other country than Belarus where those warheads are going in as soon as the, the structures to accommodate them are available. That's supposed to be next month in July. Now, bear in mind that there are five countries in Europe, or if you count, well, five countries in Europe that have these things, okay? Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Turkey, and uh, one more. <laughs> okay. Italy. Yeah, Italy. Okay. So there are five places where these nuclear weapons are stored under U.S. control, but nevertheless ready to put on these Turkish planes or whatever, okay? So uh, this is kind of just another sort of retort saying, look, remember that we have allies too, and we can be just as provocative 
in placing these nuclear weapons in these countries as you can. Now, this goes back at least six months because Putin and Lukashenko agreed that this would be done, that outfit these planes and bring them in, and then the warheads would follow. So it's not a big surprise. Uh, and to, to say this is uh, Russia upping the ante, well, in one sense it is. In another sense, it's sort of reciprocal to remind people, look, you know, we have a bargaining chip here. If you want us to take these weapons out of Belarus, we'll be happy to do that. Then you take your weapons out of Turkey, Italy, Belgium, Germany, and the Netherlands. Okay, so deal? Gotcha. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for that insight. I want to thank you for coming on today. This has been most helpful and interesting. Um, trying to you know, slog through all the information every day, knowing that a lot of it is narrative mingled with truth. And that's where they get people where it's like, well, no, there was a little bit of truth there, but mostly it was the way that they try to control our perception or our thinking around big topics. Uh, if people want to follow you and, and stay in the loop outside of interviews with me, is raymcgovern.com still the best place for them to do that? Yes, it is. I'm also on Twitter, at Ray McGovern. I just want to say, Stephen, that I welcome the chance to be on with you and with other serious, uh, I was going to say interrogators, <laughs> interviewers, okay? Uh, because uh, with, you guys are the only ones that let us get some airtime. And I think what we have to say is a perspective that people need to at least hear whether they agree with it or not is yeah. their choice. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again for coming on. I hope you have a great rest of your day.